But this, this topic goes beyond just the gut <clears throat> because it influences the mind and it'll strengthen us to be resilient in the days ahead. As you know, the, the pressure is gonna be great as, as the end times come. And one way to do that is, is through the gut. Many of the mental stresses and mental illnesses we face in this society, we're gonna talk about tonight, this has a lot to do with this. But <clears throat> in order for you to be resilient and not succumb to the stress, you need to have a strong mind. And to have a strong mind, you need to have the whole body working together with the mind. And a lot of that starts with the gut. With that being said, <clears throat> let's pray. Ask the Lord, because this is an important topic to help us tonight. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. You know this topic, leaky gut, and the effect that it can have, the gut on the brain. As a matter of fact, the gut on the rest of the body. Help us, dear Lord, to understand these things and what you would have us to do. That we would know how to take care of our bodies, not only our own, but our friends and family, those in our sphere of influence, that we could be a light. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so let us begin our time together. So we're going to go over the science behind what goes on the, with the gut and how leaky gut, which was a, a misnomer at some point, has developed. And then, at the end, we're going to talk about what you can do about it from a lifestyle perspective, not just, not just medications, but from a lifestyle perspective. So, for the gastroenterologist, the GI tract is the most important part of the body because you are what you eat. Now, if you're a cardiologist, say the heart. It's in, my, in my father's day, my father's a physician, so in his day, they said that, thank you, right there on the side. <laughs> they said the heart was the most important thing, so my father was involved with the heart. And of course, the, the brain doctors, the neurologists, and the neurosurgeons believe that the brain is the most important part. But as science has recently shown, the gut actually controls the brain, so the gut is the most important part of the body. Amen. <laughs> Today we will see the gut is involved in the regulation and proper function of other parts of the body. But we're going to look at it through the lens of the leaky gut, LG, the leaky gut. So this hypothetical unrecognized condition or fad diagnosis has turned into a pretty much a distinct medical condition with a lot of leaders in my field now writing articles about this condition. Okay. I recently went on a missionary trip with uh, your sister, Mercy Ballard here, and Anthony Ballard and Dr. Joyce Cho to Peru. Fabulous trip. If you've never been to Peru, you should go. It's a great, great place. I learned a lot there. And one thing I learned from one of the leading physicians from Peru, Dr. Carlos Casanova Lenti, who was one of the leaders in lifestyle and preventive medicine there, and he said for 50 years, and I talked to some, some other physicians there that were his apprentices, and they, said, they told me he had already passed away, but they told me he always told them, death begins in the gut. I thought that was a very profound statement. Death always begins in the gut, or at least many times does. So recent scientific discoveries are verifying that the health of our gut can affect other areas of our bodies in cryptic, inflammatory ways that are being elucidated by medical science today. As I told them last night, many of our leading institutions in this country are spending billions of dollars developing these microbiome centers, which is basically research in the GI tract. So Stanford put in a billion, UCLA put in a billion. My friend here showed me a book tonight by a guy named Dr. Mayer from UCLA, one of the leaders in the field, and he's particularly interested in the gut-brain connection. He has a book on that. So let's see how it all works. So leaky gut. So we've known that the gut can be leaky for many years. Loss of fluids, proteins, minerals, infections, invasion by commensual, that means that they already live inside of you, or pathogenic foreign bacteria that get into your system. They just sort of get past the defenses that we have, which we'll talk about at the end of this talk. Viruses, fungi, parasites. There's pathophysiologic states like Campylobacter, cholera, so many, many cholera epidemics that have been in the world, like in places everywhere, China, here in the United States, wherever. It kill many people because of leaky gut. You can't keep things inside of you. It goes out your GI tract, you'll die. Autoimmune diseases, immune dysregulated disorders like lupus, Crohn's, celiac disease, collagenous colitis, and protein-losing enteropathies. 
the rise of the term uh, leaky gut has come over the past 30 years. At first, it was like sort of a fad diagnosis. Everybody's like, what is that? We know that cholera can cause leaky gut. We know that a, a beta lipoproteinemia can cause leaky gut. We know that Crohn's causes leaky gut. But these other little things is, I mean, do, uh, do pesticides cause leaky gut? We didn't know. Could food, some foods we eat, could they cause leaky gut? We didn't think so. But as more and more people started having problems, and more and more people started trying different diets, like the paleo diet, the keto diet, and they said, I feel better. They went on the celiac diet, I feel better. And we test them for celiac, we test them for all these different diseases that we know cause leaky gut, at least what we call, in, our, in my field, leaky gut, and they didn't have them. So we said, maybe it's a syndrome. But now the data's coming in, and the data's showing that this appears to be a a real entity, and now some of the leading physicians in my field are writing articles on it in our journals. So, what are some of the disruptors? Some things that cause leaky gut. So basically, leaky gut means that the, the wall of your GI tract is disrupted for some reason. The wall is a barrier. So think about it, you're eating all this stuff. You know how little kids lick everything and put everything in their mouths, tasting everything, they sort of interact to discover their world by tasting it? You have to protect yourself against those bacteria. If they get inside you, they kill you. Matter of fact, the number one, kill, the number one killer of small children in the world is infectious diarrhea. So if this wall is not intact, then you could die. Just like cholera will surely kill you if you don't have something to treat it. So these things could be detergents, emulsifiers. That's things that they put in these processed foods that bind them together and make them last, stay on the shelf longer. If you want a long shelf life, you need to have these emulsifiers. Alcohol, tobacco, antibiotics, pesticides, you know, one of the worst is, is glycophosphate. It didn't exist when I was a little kid. That's only been in the food supply since the 1990s. And now it's the number one pesticide in the world. And they actually use that to get the crops in. So one way, this is, this is how money sort of influences use of these things. So they call it a desiccant. They call glycophosphate a desiccant. You guys should know about this and I'll tell you why in a minute, but to get all the crop in, some of the crop is ripe and some of the crop is still green. Well, the green crop sort of sometimes causes the, the harvesters to get gummed up or stuck. So in other words, to get all the crop out without having to stop and clean out the, the gummed up crop in there, they just sort of make all the crop dried out at once. They do that by spraying it with glyphosate, which they don't call as a pesticide, they call it a desiccant. And therefore, there they said, we're not using pesticides, we're using a desiccant, but it's really a pesticide. And it basically kills the whole crop, so it's dry, all of it's dried at once, and then they get it cleaned up, and they, they make more money that way. It costs less money to do it that way, so that's why they do it. And when they, like I said last night, is that when they test the, the urine of Americans, 80% of Americans have high levels of glyphosate in their blood system, in, the, in, their, in their blood and their urine. So that could be a problem. The science has to be done further as to whether it's causing a problem, but many people believe it could be. Uh, genetically modified foods, artificial sweeteners, medications such as aspirin, ibuprofen, OCP just means birth control pills, um, high animal fat diets, ultra processed food. Now this is a whole other field of, of study. Ultra processed food just means junk food. Junk food they're saying now is a leading cause of cancer. There's a lot of articles coming out about this, so much so that countries like Brazil and Canada are banning ultra-processed foods. So that's how serious this is. Low gut microbiota di biodiversity, which we're going to talk about in this, in this, in this um, talk. Basically, the number of different bacteria that you have in your gut. The less, the worse off you are. The, the more, the broader, the better you are, because then you can digest more food. It just so happens that we shipped out most of our digestion uh, processing to a, for, to, a, to, a foreign, to a foreigner, basically. We just shipped it out to China. In this case, we shipped it out to the bacteria. And we'll talk about that. A lot of the processing of fiber in our diets, which we need to live as humans, is being done by bacteria and not by ourselves. So when I started in medical school, we knew that the bacteria <coughs> were processing and making vitamin K. And without vitamin K, you bleed to death. You cut yourself, it's part of the intrinsic pathway for clotting cascades, so you get a blood clot. Without that ability to, to clot, you will bleed to death. So we knew we needed the bacteria for that, so we had a symbiotic relationship for that, but it goes way beyond that, in that you need it to just process your food. Matter of fact, if we can turn off the bacteria, 
people will probably lose weight because they can't process their food and they'll probably lose weight. So it's a whole other story. <laughs> um, hormones and neuromodulators, like cortisol, if you have too much cortisol, if you're stressed out all the time, that can cause leaky gut. If your serotonin is too low, that can cause leaky gut. All right, so what is the microbiome? So we're going to talk about the basics before we get into talking about what's going on exactly. So the microbiome is 100 trillion microorganisms that live in your gut. That's 10 times the number of cells you have in your body. A human body has 10 trillion cells. So there's 10 times as many bacteria in your gut or little organisms than there are human cells. And then if you take the genes, not the, not the, not the organisms, itself, but just the genes, the genes are 50 to 100 times more than the genes in our body, the total, gen the total genes in our body. That's pretty amazing. There's more of them than there are of us, and each one of us. <laughs> Microbiota is all the bacteria, the archaea. Archaea are these bacteria that live in extreme hot temperatures, like if you go to um, um, Yellowstone National Park and those hot geysers that you see over there, there's bacteria that live in those really hot temperatures. Those are archaea, are from really cold in the Antarctic or in the North Pole, that, those bacteria are there. And there's bacteriophages, which actually will attack bacteria and destroy them and eat them. There's viruses, fungi, and sometimes parasites, which you know, like amoeba, giardia. And some of you guys know about those parasites. Um, the microbiome, as opposed to the microbiota, the microbiome is both the microbiota and the genome, genomic material it includes. So those are the sort of the definitions. So people throw out these terms and say, oh, the microbiota, oh, the microbiome. So this is, this is so you know what they're talking about, okay? <laughs> Disrupted balance in the microbiome, increasingly associated with things like allergies, autoimmune diseases, neuro uh, metabolic disorders and neuropsychiatric disorders. So, the density of the microbiota, so anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of stool, of the stool weight, so is nothing but bacteria. Isn't that amazing? When you look at the uh, about, you say, about movie, it's like, wow, man, 30 percent of that is this bacteria? It's unbelievable. <laughs> but it is true, and in, a, in an adult male, it's anywhere two to six pounds of the stool weight in their body at any time. And there's hundreds to thousands of bacterial species, depending on whether you have low bacterial diversity or, or big bacterial diversity, right? Microbiota diversity. They live in the gut, the nose, the lungs, the mouth, the skin, any mucosal surface that interacts with the outside world. Fiber is the predominant food for the microbiota, and this is extremely important. And this could be the problem of our age, right here. So, you know, the, the Mayans disappeared. We don't know why they disappeared. The Romans had the lead pipes. And this could be our issue for our age. Not only because it causes problems with digestion, but it can cause it causing problems on a societal level that could lead to our destruction. A destruction that we as Adventists know in the great controversy is a time such as the world has never seen, where people will be acting like fiends. And we're starting to see that already, aren't we? in certain instances, but this could be part of the linchpin of that. The signal via fatty acids, other molecules and nerves, and these little microbiota, they create these short-chain fatty acids. They eat the fiber and they create short-chain fatty acids. What do you say, what is it? What's, what's so special about short-chain fatty acids? Well, that is actually food for the colonocytes, for the enterocytes, for the, all the little, little uh, cells that line our GI tract. Isn't that great? They get to eat from, the, from what the bacteria make. You see, it's a very symbiotic relationship. And then also, anti-inflammatory. So, the paradigm shift that has happened in medicine today is one where we've gone from infectious disease, predominantly, to chronic inflammatory diseases. Arthritis, right? Alzheimer's disease is a chronic inflammatory disease, really. I mean, it's, it's a lot of inflammation. Cancer, heart attacks. I mean, that's all inflammation. All these chronic diseases that we're facing could be helped, listen, by these little microbes and the, or the lack thereof and the lack of these short-chain fatty acids. So, how do these microbes talk to the body? There's interaction. They can actually talk to us. You know, if you eat certain foods, you'll want to eat those foods in the future. And now the scientists are showing that the microbes are sending signals to your brain to tell it to eat what you just, brought, what you just put in there because it gives them, an, uh, those microbes that like that food, an, an inherent advantage to survive. They get more and more of the food that they want. 
and they'll send a signal to your brain. It sort of sounds like science fiction, but you'll see how it works. And they do it through these neuroactive metabolites like GABA, tryptophan, glutathione, bile acid metabolites, short-chain fatty acids, that's what S CFA means, short-chain fatty acids, cytokines, inflammasomes, these inflammatory cytokines that go into your body. And they communicate directly or indirectly with neurons and hormones and other microbiome metabolites. So if you have some problems with that, it can affect your brain, your heart, your joints, your liver, any, basically any organ system in your body. It can affect your behavior, which is, which is what we're talking about in the great controversy when people act like fiends, your emotions, like I said last night, a way to a man's heart is a, is a good meal. <laughs> and he'll act, he'll act a lot better. And we're finding out now that food does alter your mood and alters your emotions. Pain, ingested, uh, ingested behavior. So like, like I said, ingested behavior means that you'll, you'll go back to the same food you've been eating. So if you put yourself on a good diet, you said, I don't, I don't like all that healthy food, but if you put yourself on a good diet for at least a month, you'll probably start liking it. Those microbes will start telling your brain, eat more, eat more, eat more. So we can change things if we want. Uh, stress responses, how well you deal with stress, social interactions, we'll talk about that one, that's a big one. And gut-brain interactions, we went over those social interactions last night. So there was a study done by Terry Moreland at a prison, and it showed that prisoners were less likely to, to be involved in gang violence when they're put on a plant-based protein diet. Isn't that amazing? It's just absolutely amazing. And there's a number of studies that I do when I give a talk called the, the brain-gut connection that'll show you the data behind that. So if some other time I can come back and talk about that. Um, an emerging role in irritable bowel syndrome and obesity. So we found out now that if you do a transplant of stool from a human or a mouse that is skinny and put it into a person that's obese, that that obese person will become skinny. If you take a stool from a person who's an introvert and put it into a person that's an extrovert, you'll turn an extroverted person into an introvert. That should tell you something. That should tell you something. And well, I'll give you a little diagram of how that works here in a second. So long-term brain stress may imbalance gut microbiome or vice versa, spilling over to other parts of the body. So the gut and the brain, they interact with each other. So if, this, this, this is, if you stress this out with bad food, it'll cause stress on your brain. If your brain is stressed out, it'll cause problems with your gut. Many times you know that. Like if you go to an event, like you're going to get up here and speak, and you're not used to speaking, you'll start feeling something weird going on in your stomach, right? I have to go, I, you know, some people get diarrhea, they have to go, or they, have to, they feel sort of weird. That's what, this is, that's what this is pointing out. So increase in cortisol, which is a stress hormone, increases permeability of the gut. We know that from many scientific papers. It results in systemic inflammation, overact I mean, overactivation of the hypothalamic axis. That's what that HPA means, the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Um, and the reduction in hy uh, hippocampal serotonin. Serotonin is need needed to make you feel normal. So a lot of people, they don't feel good, they feel depressed, they're anxious, they take pills that increase their serotonin level. Could it be that something's going on with their gut that's giving them a problem with this? A reduction in BDNF. What is BDNF? That's brain-derived neurotrophic growth factor, right? That's very important because you need that to repair yourself, to make your nerves work again. And we've seen that dramatically. And I, I, don't, know, I don't know if, if Sister Mercy is going to talk about that at all tonight, but she's seen dramatic instances where people have had problems with their nerves and neurologic problems that have gotten better when we use this method in the science that I'm talking about tonight. Quite amazing. There's a professor from Texas A&M who even put in a paper, which I talk about in my gut-brain connections uh, talk, where she says it's, it's incredible that we can help treat strokes by improving the GI tract. Did you hear what I said? You can improve strokes, recovery from strokes, by improving the gastrointestinal tract. That's amazing for a professor from Texas A&M Medical School to say that. So this is how it all works. I know this is sort of a conf confusing slide here, but you see the little microbes on the bottom. Is this there a pointer? I guess there's a pointer on. Is there a pointer on this thing? Or maybe not. There is? It doesn't work well. Okay. So if you go from left, you see the gut microbiome on the left. The little microbes, they release these little metabolites and neurotransmitters. See, metabolite, these little microbes can produce a substance that works as a neurotransmitter in our body. Now, how in the world does a bacteria that's not part of 
our genome. It didn't get divided and, and the zygote didn't form. Or these are bacteria that are foreign us, but they're secreting chemicals that are affecting our nerves and our bodies. You see that? Isn't that amazing? I find, I find that amazing. How does that work? How does evolution explain that? I don't, I, just, I don't think it can. And then if you look, it also makes these metabolites and metabolites go with, and they, they go into the circulation and they go to the brain. So there's several different tracks that these microbes can talk. There's, there's fast tracks, there's medium fast tracks, and there's slow tracks. So the guts can talk on three different levels. So if one, if one system fails, if the, if the fast track fails, you still got a medium speed and a slow speed to send that signal up to your brain. Give me some more McDonald's, if that's what you're eating. <laughs> or give me some more carrots, if that's what you're eating. So they have a signal to send that thing. So the neurotransmitters are like a medium track. The metabolites go slower. But you can see as you move down to the right, the immune cells. So the immune system has little cells called dendrites. And the dendrites can reach across the wall like this. And they reach into the, and they taste what's in there. And they send the signal back up to your brain. Can you believe that? They just reach across the wall and say, what's out there? And they just taste, taste, taste. And they send the signal through your blood back to your brain. And then you have these, um, colon these little uh, enterocytes. We call them colonocytes or small bowel cells. And they sit on the wall, and they are actually neurons. These are the pseudo, pseudo uh, um, mucosal cells, neurons. And they all go out, and they'll taste, and they'll send the signals directly from them to your nerve, which is through the vagus nerve. You see that little blue one in the middle? And blue is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the main medium of of the fast track to your brain. And these little inner neurocytes will send a signal back to your brain. That's the, fast, that's the fastest track right there, one right in the middle. And you move out a little bit more to, to the right, you see the spinal uh, cord path, the spinal pathways, that's, those are fast tracks too. And then you have these inner endocrine cells, and these are medium speed, so they'll release the, the cells themselves will just sit there like this, and they'll just taste a little bit of the environment too and they'll send a signal via release of hormones. So it's not as fast as a neuro, because you know, a neuro cell, pew, 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 and this is just sends a hormone out, and it'll diffuse either through the circulation or through the lymphatics, right? And it'll go back to your brain. Now, how all this stuff works, and there's even toxins that these little bacteria can make that can go into your nerves and crawl, I don't know how this happens, they crawl up your nerves to your brain and cause problems. Isn't that incredible? It's unbelievable, but that's what they're finding. You would think it's just circulation, but it's not. It goes via the nerves as well. And how do they make it up the nerves? I don't know how toxins do that. That has to be elucidated in my mind. I have to read a research paper on that one. So inflammation is a very common pathway, and it can lead to problems in all these different areas, all these different areas, whether it's the heart, the brain, the endocrine system, um, like obesity or inflammatory bowel diseases, all these different areas. You just see, just, it's, we're finding out now that inflammation in your gut can lead to problems in any of these areas. So it's sort of like the weakest link, right? The weakest link. So some people are in their family, they're, like some people are like Mercy, and they come to their place, they're, they're predisposed to thyroid problems. They get Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, or Graves' disease. That's the weak link. Some people, it's inflammatory bowel disease. Some people, like I have people that come to, they come to my office the other day that are, that are my age or even younger, and they, they have, they have uh, dementia already. That's the weak link for them. Some people, it's heart attacks. Some people, it's cancer. But you see, this might be one of the bases for this. This is why this talk is so important, not only to know about GI health, but your total body health. So prime time in the, in the lead pipe. I sort of alluded to this already, but this is prime time for our health message. And the world is catching on, y'all. The world is catching on. David actually came to our church because he was a, a punk rocker running around skateboarding and coloring his hair blue, red, and whatever other color, and wearing the thick leather coats and stuff, and he goes into a, into a what? A vegan restaurant run by a seven-day Adventist. And because of that, he saw the story of Daniel, which he never saw before, and he thought, how in the world could God know the future like that? From Babylon all the way down to Rome, and, and it wasn't any question about it, because that's already history, but God said it way before it ever happened. But those people are doing it for a reason, because they know that it leads to good health. David Sinclair, a professor of genetics at Harvard University, 
has written a book called Lifespan. And in that book, he says that there's evidence that plant-based foods extend life. There's no evidence that other foods, i.e. Um, animal products, extend life. We'll, we'll take questions at the end. I'll take questions at the end. Um, and then the lead pipe. Is this the lead pipe of our time? So the lead pipe for the Romans were that the aqueducts were lined with lead and it led to problems like Nero going crazy and killing the Christian and blaming everybody and all the issues that that led to. Or like the minds of civilization. Could this be our lead pipe? And now we get to your gut. This is what your gut looks like. The top part are the microbes. All the bacteria. The hundred trillion of them. The green part is the protective layer that we all need. It's the mucus layer. And the blue part is you. The blue part is you. The blue part is your, your colonocytes, in this case. The blue part is you. Imagine yourself in an aquarium where you can walk underneath it and you look at the fish above. Like in Moody Gardens down in Houston, you can do that. Imagine that you start seeing the, the signal slowly coming down. You're like, something's going on, something's a problem. And it gets closer and closer, and you go, I, I think we better get out of here. This thing's about to collapse. And that's what happens when you don't treat your gut right. This protective barrier disappears, and what are you going to do? What are you going to do when you start seeing that, that ceiling coming down on you? You're going to be quiet? Or are you going to say, help, help, help? We've got an alarm. It's tell everybody, call, the, call, call somebody to, to help, and tell everybody to get out of here, right? It's a five alarm, and that's what happens in your body. And this is, gonna, and this is the reason why. So... This is the biodiversity. So what they've done is taken different people groups from around the world, and they've mapped out how many bacteria they have and what types of bacteria they have in their GI tract. The Western world is the bottom, the bottom group to the, to the right. The rest of the world, the third world, is to the left, above. And as you can see, there's some, some countries that have a great biodiversity, like Mongolia. And the one that's the best, actually, is Peru. And I'm glad I went down there. That's probably why I'm feeling better. Getting to some Peruvian micro, micro, microbiota, I feel a lot better. <laughs> One thing I noticed when I was down there is that these, these Peruvian dogs are some of the calmest dogs I've ever seen in my life. These dogs run around the street. These dogs don't bark at you. They don't bite you. They don't nip at you. Nobody has a leash on them. They're just like laying around. And I was just like walking. I just walk right past them. I was like, man, these dogs are so chill. <laughs> I've never seen dogs like this in my life. And I was like, this is incredible. Maybe it's because these microbiota are just calming their brains down. And they're just so well adjusted, right? All right. So, dietary fiber fuels the gut microbiota. If you don't have fiber in your diet, you're not fueling the, the, the machinery. The gut, the microbes aren't, aren't happy. And without these microbes being happy, you can't make vitamin K. You can't make a lot of serotonin that we need to be feeling happy, which is avoid, you can avoid taking like serotonin pills. A lot of the things are being made. These waste products, you know, one man's trash is another man's gold, right? Well, the waste products from these bacteria is our gold. All right, so this is, this is a, a fiber-rich diet. It's, the blue is us, the green is the mucus layer, the red is the bacteria, and the yellow is the fiber, all right? So these bacteria are surrounding the fiber and eating it up, making all these products that we need for our bodies. So microbiota accessible carbohydrates, MAC, so MAX for short. Just remember that term, MAX. It just means basically fiber. Fuel for microbiota. As you can see, the top part there, if you have like a, like a broccoli, it makes it all the way to the colon. If you're eating junk food at the bottom, cake, candy, McDonald's stuff, you can see it gets stuck. And this is why America might be getting more and more obese. And this is why we as a people, as I pointed out last night in the journal Economics, they pointed to the Seventh Day of Venice as maybe a to helpful solution to America to solve the obesity epidemic that we have. Because we as a people, if you look at the bell-shaped curve, not, th not that all of us are skinny, but if you look at the bell-shaped curve, we're shifted over to the skinnier side as a people. And they know, and people that know demographics 
and um, epidemiology know this, and then they're pointing to us as a possible solution to obesity because we're over to the, to, the, to the right on the bell-shaped curve. And it's possible because it's because of this issue. The more junk food you eat, the less likely you are to have fiber in your cold, and the more likely you are to eat these calories. The calories are going to be all absorbed in the small bowel. Whereas with the fiber, less is absorbed in the small bowel. That means that you're getting less calories absorbed, less weight, okay? But it's important to get to the colon because then you make the metabolites that we need. And as you can see down at the bottom, it says the human microbiome is, um, creates less than 20 genes to degrade dietary carbohydrates. I think, let me just back up for one right here. So if you look at the bottom of this slide, it says, the human genome contains approximately 17 genes to degrade fiber, dietary fiber, whereas the microbiome has 60 to 100,000 genes to degrade dietary fiber. That means that we've shipped out the process of degrading the fiber to the, to the bugs. We're not doing it ourselves. Isn't that amazing? All right. This is a similar picture, but basically the title spells it out. Simple carbohydrates starve your microbiota. So what happens if you're starving? What are you going to do? If you're one of those little bugs and you're starving, what are you going to do? There's nothing around for you to eat. Hmm? Anybody have any ideas? What's that? Send signals, okay. Anybody, anybody else? Well you, could die. well, you could die. You could die. That's right. You could die. Or you could try to survive. And what are you going to do to survive? You're going to eat anything you can get your hands on. And that's exactly what they did. And that's what they did during the, what, the fall of the river. They were eating whatever, leather, whatever they get their hands on, just, just anything, try to eat something. So they start eating you. The microbes start eating you. And that's the problem. Because they start eating the mucus layer and that ceiling starts coming down and the five alarm system starts to go off and all this inflammation, it's an inflammatory state. Whenever you have an infection, what happens? These little bacteria, they're being separated by mucus, but whenever the, see the bacteria is getting too close, it's like cholera or giardia or any other infectious agent. They're commensual, that means that they live with us, but when they get too close, they become a danger to us and our body starts to send inflammatory signals all over the place, which can start leading to inflammation and, and whatever part of the body is most susceptible, whether it's your thyroid, whether it's your heart, whether it's your skin, whether like, you know, whatever it is, it starts sending a signal. We've got a problem. So, uh, this is sort of a bad slide, but if you can see, normal is on the left, and no food is on the right. The bacteria start getting too close, and this is what happens on a, on a low-fiber diet. And what you see down here, this is the same slide, but it has another part on the bottom. If you look specifically at the last row, where it starts with the V, I know it's a lot of different bacterial names, but it's the one on the bottom that says the V. As you can see, it's called a V bloom, and they call it a bloom. You know, like they have these blooms in the ocean, or they have these little things that grow up, and they say it's a blooming this time. This is what they're talking about. This is a bloom, and you can see it's only happening in Western populations. You notice that? But we have low fiber diets because we're eating fast food, basically. Whereas the other parts of the world, they don't have that bloom. Those bacteria that starts with the letter V right there, guess what they eat? Anybody have an idea? They eat mucus. They're mucus eaters. So basically, they're eating you. And you have to keep trying to produce this barrier that's healthy to keep this area, but you, many times you can't keep up. So you have a chronic inflammatory state occurring in your bodies because the, mucus, the protective mucus layer is not there anymore, or it's being degraded to a point where you're having a, maybe a one alarm, a two alarm, three alarm, four alarm, and maybe a five alarm fire going on. You're, that's, what, that's what your body, that's what it's, the signal is telling your body. For some people it's obvious, like inflammatory bowel disease, where you get a breakdown, you know, people are in there and they're in the hospital struggling for their lives, and that's people that I, I take care of, right? And that's a, that's a straightforward disease process that we know. But when you have leaky gut, the quote-unquote leaky gut that we were talking about today, it's a little subclinical. So you might be walking around thinking you're fine, but you might have this going on, and this might be causing some of your problems that you're having. Your arthritis, you know, your heart problem, all those different things can show up. 
So this is a slide you should remember. If I can get to the next slide. Uh oh. Can you get the next slide for me? Thank you. So low diversity microbiota associated with poor health. So in this graph here, you have LGC and HGC, which is low gene content and high gene content. And you can see the, the gene numbers there. So low gene content is associated with increased um, obesity, basically. Increased circulating cholesterol, increased inflammation, higher insulin resistance, that I mean, leads to diabetes, increased triglycerides. And you know, diabetics, in every diabetic case, you'll see this. You'll see for type 2 diabetes, the triglycerides go up first and you get an increase in inflammation, which is usually associated with that, and then the, sh then the glucose starts to go up in type 2 diabetics. And you have increased free fatty acids, decreased HDL, which is the good cholesterol, which removes the bad cholesterol out of your bloodstream, and a higher white blood cell count. In other words, inflammation, right? Higher blood cell, that means inflammation. Dietary fiber associated with health, associated between dietary fiber and lower risk of all-cause mortality. So, Sometimes we're dying sooner than we have to. And if you don't believe it, this is a study from uh, the Journal of Epidemiology that actually shows that, right? They had about a million people, and they had about 70,000 deaths. And what they, sh what they found was a 10% reduction in the risk for each 10 grams per day of extra dietary fiber you ate. So if you ate 10 more grams of dietary fiber a day, you had a 10% less risk of dying. That's pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive. Could it be you, 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 the people that are not eating that fiber have more, more inflammation that's leading to problems like heart attack, stroke? Yeah, I think so. Cancer? So can dietary fiber deficient diet result in irreversible lysis of microbiota, which is what we saw from the third wheel um, biodiversity or microdiversity to the first world, right? So they took mice and they put human uh, microbiome in these, in these clean mice. So you can make clean mice that, that, that don't have any, you know, uh, microbiome and then put human, basically human stool in these mice and then watch them over three, four generations. And so what they did, they did this, and if you look at the, the results, the results are the actual experiment at the top, and the second one below are the controls. So on the top, you have first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation. As you can see, as you go down, it goes down in a slant. That means they're losing biodiversity of the microbiota in their, inside their guts. So with each generation, they lost the number of types of bacteria that were in their gut. And this is from the Sonnenberg lab at uh, Stanford University. So mucus thickness is affected by diet. So the more fiber we have, that means the more food the bugs have, and they don't have to eat you. If they don't have anything around, they're going to have to eat whatever they can to survive. Because, I mean, it's, you know, that's, that's what we all do, right? We all have to survive. And so they just eat the mucus if they have to, and they will. Now, this didn't exist when I was in medical school in the 1990s, something called inflammasomes. At least we didn't know that it, that it existed, but it existed. We just didn't know about it then. So basically what this is, is a signal from your, from whatever inflammatory site it is, it sends a signal out to the rest of the body that there's inflammation and we need to do something about it. So it's a signaling pathway called the NLRP3 and it's activated by bacteria, bacterial molecules, stress, diseases, pesticides, all these things activate this thing, right? And as we pointed out, all those things happen in the gut, all those things. It's like a miniature hurricane within cells that stimulate the production of all these inflammatory cytokines. And it's linked to cell death processes, linked to neurodegenerative processes like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, depressive disorders, anxiety, autoimmune disorders like psoriasis, lupus, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases. So you start a little hurricane in your body when you allow stuff like this to go on, when you don't get enough fiber. And so remember that term MAC, microbiota associated carbohydrate. Um, so in healthy people, they make all these short chain fatty acids, um, they have low mucus um, consumption, and they are, they're healthy. But in people that don't, in industrialized countries where we have low fiber diets, they don't have short chain fatty acids, which are necessary for us to have these anti-inflammatory molecules. So your bugs are making these anti-inflammatory molecules that we need, right? 
And so you get a rodent mucus layer, you get this leaky gut, a leaky epithelial barrier, which is the real, real definition, and you get systemic, this is LPS, this is a, let's say a bacterial toxin, basically, a systemic LPS, and you get inflammation. So you get all this bacterial overproduction, because everything is, the signal's going off, these bacteria are too close. They're good bacteria, but they're getting too close to us, and we've got we to gotta do something about it fast. So, could all these chronic diseases, what's the root cause of them? Could it be diet? Could it be strange chemicals? Could it be a sedentary lifestyle, hygiene? Could it be antibiotics, pesticides? Could it be all these things? Yeah. But could it be that we've changed the way we eat? When I was a little kid, there were a few fast food places like McDonald's, maybe a little Burger King. I don't know, some of the people that are older here know that, that, you know, that they didn't exist. But now they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Sometimes I wonder, I say, in these chicken places, I say, like, how do we get all the chicken for these chicken places, you know? You thought about that? It's just mind-boggling. But the, you know, when you're in a rush, like sometimes I'm in a rush, you want to go somewhere fast to get some food. You don't go home and make a meal. But a lot of the problems that we have in Western societies can be solved if we just went home and made a meal. And I'm not even asking you to, to do everything that I, that I do, you know, trying to be vegan. If you just go home and make a meal, you're going to be so much better off. So much better off. So this is, this is from one of the Sonnenberg from Stanford University, one of their papers, and it put out multi-hit hypothesis for Western microbiota deterioration, so the lack of, of diversity of the microbiota. Diet, sanitation, antibiotics, vaccinations, C-sections, baby formula. And this is from their paper. This is what they're thinking. Could this foreign microbiome inside our guts be dysregulating our immune system? So a lot, there's a lot of hypotheses of, of this going on, but nobody has really documented what's going on. And so even in our, our, our lifestyle institutions, we know it works, but we have to document it. And so what's being done now in the field is starting to document all these things. They're asking some questions that they don't know the answers to, but a lot of it is in the spirit of prophecy. They haven't read it, though. So implications of the human data, microbiota extension over time. So in Tanzania, they have great biodiversity because they're eating a lot of tubers and roots and things like that. Malawi, which is in Africa, Venezuela, and South America, they have pretty good biodiversity. USA, we're, we're sort of lacking, right? We're lacking. So westernization of the gut microbiome. So if you take people that are, that are immigrants or people that are new arrivals, and then they come in, and then there's people that, that have green cards, which are next. They, they start increasing in size, and you can see their, their biodiversity starts to go down for certain types of, of bacteria in their, in their GI tracts. And there's certain types, like the V-type or the bacteroides, starts to increase the longer they're here, until they're finally full Americans to the right. And as you can see here, the line shows the biodiversity goes down. Just like with those mice, the longer you're on a, a a fiber-poor diet, the worse you're going to be. So please go eat your fiber, right? <laughs> I remember there was a gastroenterologist when I first, started, I first got out of, out of uh, fellowship, and he would always tell his patients to, to eat fiber. Just make sure you get some fiber. Make sure you get some fiber. And he was right. He was absolutely right. Our microbiome identity has changed. So we've changed. We don't know our identity's changed, but we've changed. The inside of us has changed. The bugs have changed inside of us. From where we were, a century ago, our grandparents and our great-grandparents had probably better biodiversity than we have today. That's what, these, that's what this data is telling us, right? And the number of chronic diseases is on the rise. The 1950s to the 2000s, you can see the increase in multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, and asthma has all gone up across the board. All these chronic diseases have all gone up. My, oh, my, how could this be? What's going on? Could it be our diet? I think the data is starting to say, it's starting to tell us a good story, right? It could be. I think the spirit of prophecy was correct all these years. Can we repair our microbiome, improve our health? Can we go from being obese, inflamed state, to being a, a lean, mean, non-inflamed people? So dietary intervention, so high micro, higher microbiota diversity and better health. So, so in this study, they took, so the top dark line is the controls, and the bottom is the experimental group, right? And so what they did is they took people, and they fed women 1,200 calories, men 1,500 calories. 
35% protein, 25% lipid, and 40% low glycemic index carbohydrates. That's fiber. Low glycemic carbohydrates means it doesn't have much sugar in it, which is basically fiber, right? And enriched in soluble fiber. And they saw improvement. People were less fat, less obese. Improved insulin sensitivity, decreased triglycerides, which as we know is a marker before you get diabetes, and decreased inflammation. And this is Dr. Sonnenberg from Stanford University. He used himself as a test subject. And so, as you can see there, in 2000, what is that? Oh, it's a five-year study. What's that, 2000? I can't read. 2010 until 2015, right? So he had about 600 different types of bacteria in his gut. So he took his stool and tested it himself. 600 different types of, of bacteria in his stool in 2010. And by 2015, he had up to 1,200, I believe. 1,200. And what he did is he had a garden. Oh, have y'all heard that before? You should have a garden. I think I have. Our church is big on that. Have a garden. And he would go out there and he would pull the stuff out of the garden. And guess what he would do? He said, I, did not, I do not wash it off with any type of detergent. I just stick it in my mouth. I just rinse it off and stick it in my mouth. That's what he says. He also had a dog. He said, pets are important. Pets will increase your biodiversity. He says, those pets will lick on your stuff, give you all sorts of good bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> so doing that, eating fresh, fresh produce out the garden and, and having pets and things like that, he increases biodiversity over a five-year period. So we can improve ourselves too. Give your dog a kiss. <laughs> Peaches. <laughs> it's one of my friends. Okay, now this is the landmark study in the field right now, and this was produced by the Sonnenberg uh, Lab. It's called, I call it the FIFIFO. FIFIFO-FUM, but it's the FIFIFO study. And in it, what they did was they tried to figure out what, what's the best way to, to, to replenish the biodiversity inside people. And they came up with a conclusion I don't totally agree with, because what they did is they, they took people that use fermented foods like kimchi, kombucha, you know, sauerkraut, you know, fermented foods like that. And we know from Spirit of Prophecy, that might not be the best food in it because it's got sometimes alcohol in it, like kombucha sometimes has alcohol in it, vinegar, which can be tough on the system. But they had another group that was just fiber. So they said, okay, in that group, you just go out and buy and eat as much fiber-type foods as you can. There was no specification that it had to come out of the garden, it had to be fresh or anything like that. They just said, just get as much fiber as you can. So sometimes you just go to the store and buy a packaged fiber, you know, it's almost sort of processed fiber. You can get a muffin that's fiber and things like that. And those people are in that group. So when they compared all the groups, the best group was the fermented food group. So I think if they redid the study and they did it with people that were eating it straight out the garden, they might have a different result. But in this study, which is the landmark study, the people that were eating the fermented foods had the best outcome. So you can see that the biodiversity in the bottom middle, it shows a line that's going up. It's going up to the right, and that shows that the biodiversity in your gut, or in, the, in these patients' guts, was increasing over time. And they did it over a 14-week interval. So they had, a, they had a, a baseline that was three weeks before they started the study, and so they were checking all their bio, microbiota for at least three weeks before. They had a ramp up for four weeks. They had a maintenance stage for, for about four or five weeks, and then they had a, a patients could choose after that for four weeks. So it went for a total of four. Well, if you told the, the baseline to us, 14 plus 3, so 17 weeks total, right? And what they show was there's an increase in biodiversity, but the most important part of the study is the bottom right, decreasing markers of inflammation. So for the first time, they proved that you can change the immune system by what you eat. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, guys. Not only can we choose the immune system, we can change the neurologic system, we can change a lot of the systems in the body, but this is the first time they showed this. And that is, you can decrease IL-12, IL-6, IL-10, and IL-17A. This is the landmark study. He says, we can definitively say that we can change the immune system based on diet now. This is very important. And this is where we as a people need to go ahead and step in and start doing this, some of these studies ourselves, because we know some things that, that could be answered, because they don't know. Because John Harvey Kellogg, who was considered the best physician of his day, 
not only by Ellen White, now she, she gave the statement that you are the greatest physician in the world right now, but as verification of that, that Henry Ford would go there, Carnegie would go to, to Battle Creek to go see this man. And I went to Battle Creek for the first time, and I saw what the health message had did, and I was just astounded. This big area right here is one column in the building that he erected for his sanitarium, one column. This place was humongous. It wasn't what God wanted, though. God has told us that we're supposed to have little places, little wellness centers, sanitarium, lifestyle centers like what Mercy Ballard and Anthony have, and we're supposed to replicate that all over the world because people need to have interaction one-on-one -on -one with people that, are, that they know in their sphere of influence. But it is still a testimony to the greatness of the message, and we're seeing it scientifically now as these people from the leading universities in our country are discovering what we've known and we've done by faith in our sanitarium. And this is an exciting new field called Synthetic biology. Now, I was a biology major, so I'm really excited about this. But basically, we can just take a bacteria, genetically engineer it, and treat whatever disease we want. Uh-oh. Did that thing got to turn anything off? Can you still hear me? Okay. Yeah. So if you have depression, we can engineer a bacteria and put it inside of you to treat your depression, to treat your anxiety, to treat your schizophrenia, to treat your obesity, to treat your, you know, you pick, you pick a disease, we probably can do it. Isn't this crazy? So it says the human microbiome as a technology platform for manipulation of the human biology. That is treating diseases, people. But we can do it naturally, too, right? If we eat right, if we do what we know we should do, which is we should garden, get fresh produce. If you can't garden, find somebody in your area who does do it, or go to the farmer's market and get it there, wherever, you know. It's the fresher, the better, right? And increase your diversity of your microbiome. And this is Dr. Sonnenberg at home with his family, his wife at the upper left and his two daughters. He's at the bottom right. And interestingly, he says, making a commitment to fiber consumption that today borders on the comical. As a friend of mine would say, I'm willing to be a fool for Jesus, amen? <laughs> no matter what anybody says, if we just live up to what we know, even though people might not agree with it, it'll be a great testimony. David Asher says, when the health study, health study one came out and all that data showed that we live seven years longer than everybody else and that we have a better quality of life. In other words, we're not in a nursing home. We can actually still drive around, pump the gas, go to the mall, buy stuff for our kids, you know, whatever we want to do, go travel the world, whatever it is, that it would be an even greater if we had been more, uh, had more veracity in applying the health message that we know that's written in our, in our books. Yeah. And that's coming from David Asherick. And I was like, and I thought about that, but then when I started doing this talk, I was like, you know, he's, he's absolutely right. And it, why, why can't we stand up for what we've been told, which borders on the comical, you know? And be a spectacle unto the world, which is what, what 1 Corinthians 4.19 says, we'd be a spectacle unto the world. We brought that up last night. Well, let's be a spectacle. He's being a spectacle. Matter of fact, he says when they go to conferences now, that the data is so strong that the people walk, the people that are the staff at these hotels walk up to him and they say, hey, who are you guys? And, and Sonnenberg said, why are you asking? He said, we've had to change out the salad bar 10 times. We, we, this never happens to us. It's at the conference like this. The data is that strong, y'all. The, the scientists, the, the punk rockers like David Asher before he came to church, they're all understanding the science and they're listening to what we have known for over 100 years. This is serious. But what do we do about it? So let's find out what we do about it. So there's some other laws that will help the GI tract and help you get your gut in order that will help the rest, of part, the rest of your body. Not only your brain, the brain-gut connection, but the brain heart connection, the brain skin connection, the brain liver connection, the brain pancreas connection, all those different connections. Rest. Rest is important. So the alimentary tract. So the GI tract is like waves of an ocean, right? It's mostly small waves, but occasionally you get a large wave. If you ever go to the beach, you see that? You see little waves, and all of a sudden you see a big wave. That's the wave you're waiting for if you're a surfer, right? You're waiting for that big wave to come in and ride it. 
And actually, surfing's actually fun. I started trying, my son started doing something. Actually, it's like a mini surfing, it's like boogie board. He said, hey, let's, let's do boogie board. And I said, all right, all right. So I went there, man, that is a lot of fun. I, love, I think if I was younger, I'd probably start surfing. It was, it was really fun. So it's like a water park. You can't run this water park 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You've got to rest it. You've got to be able to fix things that break, because things break, right? As we all know. The other day I was doing something, I hurt something in my body. I, bro- I broke something, so I've got to rest and fix it. You've got to change the oil. Well, we're finding out now that fasting is a way to repair your body. The latest craze is intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is when you fast more than 12 hours. So from the last meal of the day, so say about, what time is it now? Well, maybe say like right now, if you wait another 12 hours to the next day, so then the morning, if you wait 12 hours, you get a life benefit. You live longer. And if you do 17 hours, you live even more. And if you don't believe it, I was at the EQ Summit with Dr. Nedley, and there was a guy who was 114 years old who lives in Botswana, who's one of the leaders of his Pathfinder group in his church. The man does sit-ups, push-ups, pull-ups. He looks like he's only like maybe 65, 70 at the most, and he's 114. He had his Pathfinder uniform on, and he wasn't struggling. This guy was going. I was like, you got to be kidding me. But what is his lifestyle? He's a farmer in Botswana, and he gets up every morning, like 3 o'clock in the morning, way before the sun comes up, makes his breakfast, which, you know, for a farmer is what? It's farm products. So he's eating, like, roots and things like that for breakfast. I would say, like, yucca, just to, just to get him, yucca or some, some, some type of tuber. He's eating that in the morning. Then he's out to the fields, and he stays out in the field till about 2 o'clock. He comes in, he fixes his dinner. He's done by 3, right? And that's it. When the sun goes down, I don't know if he has lights in his house, but I know he probably goes to sleep when the sun goes down. He probably just goes to sleep the old-fashioned way. Early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. And he's, he's, he's proof in my mind that this actually works. He gets his rest. So intermittent fasting decreases visceral fat. That's all the belly fat. So if you want to lose that belly fat, cut off that snacking. I tell patients in my office now, cut it off after five. If you're retired, cut it off. If you've got a job and you've got to get home, then as soon as you get home, eat and then stop. Just drink water after that. It's a little bit tough at first. Your body's going to scream. You'll get used to it, though. And you know what? You sleep better. When I cut out that snack and late at night, I sleep so much better. I'm just like anybody else. Sometimes I get home and I'm just like, oh, I'm going to... And I'm going to sleep as well. But if I don't, if I purposely say I'm not going to eat and I just go ahead and go to bed, I sleep so much better. Um, and this has been shown in a number of studies now, and actually it was in the spirit of prophecy, right? The other thing is, is that in my area, I, 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 I sort of jokingly say Homer Simpsonville, where I live, because we have so many of these big plants everywhere. We have Conical Phillips, BASF, Dow Chemical, all these big plants. So we, are, we typically do something called shutdown. So I explain this in their terms, right? It's like Jesus talking to the people in his day at the lakeside and using the, the, the imagery from from what the people know. And so I say, a rest is like a shutdown. And a shutdown, as you guys know, the explosion in Texas City that happened, have you, you guys have heard about that? Now there's a big explosion at the plants. Well, if you don't do a shutdown correctly, that's what you get. You get a big explosion. Or you get the plant to where things don't work and you lose not tens of million, which is what you lose when you do a shutdown, because you have to shut it down for a while, so you're not producing the product. But if you have an explosion or something bad goes on and you're losing hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions, of some, and who can replace a life, right? Who can replace a life when a big explosion occurs? But when they do those shutdowns, they replace all the broken parts, they check everything, they make sure the screws are tight, they, do, they have to do all this stuff. And I have patients that come in that are technicians and safety guys, and they say, we have to check every little, every little thing to make sure everything's running right. So, uh-oh, my, my screen went off. Oh, there it is, okay. So that's what your body does. It's called senolytics. So in science, we call it senolytics. So senile, you know what senile means. You get old and senile, you, your brain doesn't work right. But it's lytic. Lytic means to, to destroy or to lice. So you, you get rid of or destroy the bad parts. So in your body, when you're fasting, you're getting rid of the bad parts. And there's a lady named Anna Maria Corvo, who's a professor of medicine at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in Philadelphia, who has shown that if you fast for three days, just three days, that you can get rid of the, tax, the plaques and tangles in your brain that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. 
So Jesus was our example, wasn't he? Jesus was our example. Sometimes you have to fast, people. Sometimes you have to fast. Sometimes you have to fast. With fasting is a rest for your GI tract. The next thing is chewing. Digestion begins in the mouth. Chew well before you. So the two or three bites, chew ten. I had a cousin. She was a little skinny girl when she was growing up. This girl would be the last one to play with her. Her name was Nayuri. And Nayuri would just sit and just chew and chew and chew. I said, Nayuri, I said, what do you do? I said, how do you do that? I just, I just, like, two, three bites, I'm just down the hatch, right? But in my field, it's important, especially when you get older and you've got a problem swallowing. Chewing is so important to get it not only from your mouth to your stomach, but also it starts the digestive process. You mix it with all these digestive enzymes like lipase and amylase and all these different enzymes that help you digest your food. And it stops a lot of dyspepsia. Dyspepsia is where you have this discomfort, bloating, belching, nausea, reflux. If you just eat the food, chew it well, it won't just sit in your stomach fermenting because it's too big to get through the pylorus, through the, the, the little barrier between your stomach and your small bowel, and causing all this, these problems that, you're, that many patients have. And even sometimes some infections. So just chew well. The digestion begins in the mouth. The next is the acid barrier. Your pH in your stomach is really low. So it's like two, which is like, if you stick your finger, it'll like eat it away, right? But the stomach is lying in such a way that it can survive, unless there's something that breaks down the layer. And guess what? There's a mucus layer in the, in the, in the, in the stomach as well that protects it against this acid barrier. So H. pylori, or Helicobacter pylori, which is a common bug in my field, breaks down that barrier, right? It's a pathogenic bacteria, not a commensual bacteria. Other things do it too, like detergents and things like that. So. Drinking water with your meals, the reason why this might not be so good is because you dilute the reaction. So in my area, we have these reactions that are going, if you dilute the reaction at Dow Chemical, you're going to cost them millions of dollars because they have catalysts, things that make the reaction go faster. And if you dilute those catalysts down, you put more water in there, and you dilute the, and then the catalyst can't work because they got to they gotta grab this and they got to grab that basket and put it together to make the reaction. That's what a catalyst does, right? So if the catalyst is diluted and it's way over there, and then I gotta grab this and I gotta go way over there and get the thing and make the reaction, it slows the reaction down. So that's why they say do not drink when you eat your meals, right? That's the science behind it, all right? So as a GI physician, if I go and if I eat something questionable, like say a potato salad, I'm less likely to take anti-acid medicines, you know? Because I know in my stomach still the acid will protect me. Like if I'm out somewhere and I'm traveling or whatever and I'm just gonna eat, I'm just, you know, eating something to, get to, to make it, I'm less likely, if, if, I, was take, if, if I were to take an acid pill, I mean an acid reducing pill, I'd be less likely to do it if I, had that, if I knew that that was going to happen. Uh, bloating, belts, and dyspeptic pain, malabsorption, infectious diarrhea, and leaky gut can result from diluting these reactions in your stomach. All right? Also interesting, drinking with meals is associated with increased risk of depression. What do you think of those beans? Why do you think that is? You thought about that? That's the data that's coming out. If you drink with your meal, you're more likely to be depressed. Probably because you're, you're, making, a, you're making it less likely that the food is digested and the bacteria can do the effective jobs and it's decreasing the amount of metabolites that are being sent to the brain. And we talk about that in that gut-brain connection that I give as well. So we, I can do that another time. Motility. Motility is very important. So it's like a river. If a river's rolling clean, it goes, if it's flowing strongly, everything's going well. But if you have eddies or places where it gets stagnant, where the water's not flowing, then the bacteria grow, the, you know, the mosquitoes start to breed, the tadpole, all these different things start building up, all the soot and the algae start growing, all those problems. That's what happens with you, and there's not good motility. And we see this in some patients that have had surgery. Um, it doesn't flow like it used to, and they start having problems with dyspepsia, bloating, gas, and they come to me seeing me saying, oh, I've had all this stuff since I had my surgery, you know, and, or this happens. Or if they have constipation. One of the eight doctors that comes to visit actually helps with motility, and that's air. And that's something that I teach patients when we do our New Start programs. I tell them deep breathing. It's the latest thing in my field, actually, gastroenterology, as we go around, and these are people that are masters of the college. These are people that are supposedly have mastered all the material in gastroenterology. And they come to speak to all the rest of the gastroenterologists like myself, and they tell, tell your patients to do deep breathing. Why? Because when you do that, 
you increase the motility of the GI tract. So there's the autonomic nervous systems for you guys that don't know medicine, and it's divided into two halves, sympathetic and parasympathetic, right? So things that you don't think about. You don't think about telling your heart to beat while you're asleep or breathing while you're asleep, right? You don't tell yourself to move the food from your, from your mouth to your esophagus to your stomach. You don't tell it to come back or you could, to your mouth or you could chew it, you know, like, like a cow, right? Like chew the cud. <laughs> You don't, you don't tell it to do that, it goes down, down it move from your stomach to your small bowel to the colon, or, or, it's all on autopilot, right? The problem is, in Western society, we are sympathetically driven. I gotta get things done. Oh, I'm so anxious about this. There's a psychiatrist that gave a talk, he said that we're the most anxious nations in history, that being the United States and Western Europe. We're so anxious because we gotta get things done. We're driven to produce, right? Which is not bad. We've done, a, we've done a great job, and we're the most advanced society that's ever existed. So we've done a great job, but we're over-anxious. We're always worried about things. The fight or flight, the bear's coming. i got to run. i got to get out of there. That's always on. We don't know how to use the parasympathetic. And God put both there for a reason. The parasympathetic system is the relaxation side. It just so happens the GI tract runs on this side. It doesn't run on this side. It doesn't run on sympathetic. It runs on this side. So I tell my patients, think about Spain, España. Think about Spain because they know how to what? Siesta. They take two hours for lunch, they take a two hour nap after that, and then they go back to work. If you guys have ever been, I recently went to Spain for the first time and I couldn't get something to eat for dinner until eight o'clock. I was like, aren't these people open at six o'clock? They were all closed. Because <laughs> they know how to relax. So I tell patients, you got to learn how to relax. So if you don't know how to relax, you can override the system. And how do you override the system? Deep breathing. Four seconds in, six seconds out. Four seconds in, six seconds out. I tell my patients to do that, and I just tell them to do it 10 times, do it in the morning, after lunch, after dinner, and before they go to bed. You can do it more if you like. That's diaphragmatic breathing, and it turns on the parasympathetic nervous system, and guess what? It turns on your GI tract. I had one patient that was 30 years old, a woman that came in, she said, Dr. Sweat, I can't have a bowel movement unless I relax. I said, you just diagnosed yourself. <laughs> So you, and you can override it, and you can turn it on. But people, sometimes people are dyspeptic or have constipation or motility issues because their, their parasympathetic nervous system is not working. Because, and, and I said, are you anxious? Said, oh, yes, I'm anxious all the time. We have to learn these health principles, right? And we've been told this, and they're very, very important. As a matter of fact, they're the, it's this, this area of air and breathing is now at the forefront of my field of gastroenterology. And we've known it for over 100 years. Navy SEALs use this in combat, so they use the breathing techniques as well to keep calm when everything's going wrong around them, all this, you know, and they're in a firefight, and, you, and you, adrenaline's pumping, and you can make mistakes. You gotta be able to use that breathing technique to, to calm yourself down and be able to, to do what you do your mission as you, as you have been trained to do. So the brain-gut connection, we've been talking about this. Um, so perturbations in this complex c connection via the uh, neurology, immunology, and endocrine and microbiota, as we saw in that, in, that, in that complicated slide, happens. And can lead to, to um, brain disorders, can lead to gut disorders. In many cases, the underlying pathophysiology leads to, to leaky gut, as we discussed. And finally, the intestinal wall. A breakdown in the single layer, a combination or any above def defenses can lead to breakdown in the last barrier. That's the leaky, that's the, the wall, the leaky gut, the intestinal wall itself. And particularly that mucus layer. Who would have thought the mucus? But mucus is like a, a complex lattice structure that you can see here. It's like a beautiful lattice, like a honeycomb. And it just, it just stacks up and keeps us protected. And this is that complex interaction that I explained earlier. And this is where we stop. God is asking us to do what borders on the comical. Not so much anymore. We're not such a, um, I don't know what you call it, I want to say a sore thumb, but we don't stand out as much as we used to because other people are catching on to what we've always been doing. So let us take a stand and let us apply the health message in our lives. And with that, I'll end my talk. You want uh, mercy?
Okay, we appreciate that talk. Boy, that answered a lot of my questions that I had, as in why uh, symptoms and whatnot. But let's go ahead and take five minutes. You guys have five minutes to stand up, stretch, and do some deep breathing, All right? Just four seconds in, six seconds out, was that, or was that reverse? Four to six, okay. Let's see if we can do that for four seconds. Everybody breathe in. Six seconds out. Boy, that felt good. <laughs> Let's do it again. One more time. In for four seconds. In and out. Yeah, I even got an amen on that. <laughs> very good, very good. Okay, now we're going to um, uh, just take a few seconds, get some water, go restroom. We're going to start with Mercy's presentation in just a few minutes as soon as she is ready.
Okay, to get everybody back in here, why don't we sing un... There you go. He's able, he's able. I know he's able, but I can't, I'm not able, so I'm going to invite Brother Jay because he is able to sing. He's able to let me sing. But we're going to stand up still because we're going to sit, we're going to be sitting down for a while. So let's stand up again. We're going to sing and we're going to do it the old fashioned way. You know that it is? Then in heaven, there's no piano, there's no organ. Every, the good Lord hears our voice. Amen? Our voice. All right? So let's start together. Yeah. All right. He's able. He's able. I know he's able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able. He's able. I know he's able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. What does he do? He heals the brokenhearted and sets the captive free. He made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. I know he's able, he's able. I know he's able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. Thank you, Brother Jay. Let's just bow our heads. Uh, we have began a new week. The sun has set. And let's just welcome in the new week. And then we'll have our sister with the next topic. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for such a beautiful Sabbath day that you have given us. A day that we were able to rest and we could learn a lot about ourselves and how you have wonderfully made us. So, Father, as we begin this week, we pray that your presence will continue with us, that we may implement what we have learned, and that we can do it all to your honor, your glory, and we ask just for your blessing this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Sister Mercy Ballard, come on up. We're going to talk about how to recover from leaky gut. This is the one we have been all waiting for. Okay, this thing. Thank you. Well, that, that class from Dr. Sud was amazing. I really enjoy it because that's my field of practice, but I love the science behind it. So that was like the most amazing lecture I, I ever heard on the science. So we're going to talk about what do we do when we have leaky gut, the practical part. And, but before that, I just want to let you know, we have a YouTube channel, how to feed your good bacteria, how to create diversity of bacteria. So that our YouTube channel is Gut Health Kitchen. So G-U-T Health Kitchen. So we have different types of breads that are um, gluten-free and also no chemicals of any type. So we just added uh, bagels just last week. So you might want to try. The few people that were here that tested, they, like, they, they love it. So there's cheese here, you know, all these staple foods that you, you can learn how to do it. Very, very simple recipes. Then we have, of course, Med Missionary. This is our online course that you can sign up. It's uh, medmissionary.com, medmissionary.com. And uh, so we're going to give you the details there week by week uh, how to do to incorporate all this plant-based with a lot of diversity of foods, create diversity of, of microbiome. So um, that's how we teach you with a menu, not just tell you, oh, you should eat this and this and this and that, but we tell you exactly how to eat breakfast, exactly exactly how to eat lunch, and how to rotate your proteins, things like that. So we, you find out that we're going to do tomorrow morning our class on how to eat. Uh, and we'll give you recipes, and you guys can download it if you sign up. Uh, so, but you will have to sign up tonight. Okay, then, um, you know, 
when you're dealing with autoimmune disorders, the three things, like I was saying last night, is inflammation, so you have to eat anti-inflammatory foods, right? What are the inflammatory foods? We're going to talk uh, in, in a little bit. And then dysbiosis, Dr. Sweat talked about it, and internal uh, permeability. So we want to fix this. We want to fix this biosis, which is the unbalance of the bacteria, and we want to fix the leaky gut, and of course, we want to remove inflammation. Um, so I'm not going to go over the science because Dr. Sweat went over that. And then when you're going to have infections, chronic infection, you're going to end up with leaky gut. Um, also, of course, this biosis. Um, also, gluten has been linked. There's so many studies about gluten and leaky gut and autoimmune disorders. So that's why we totally remove gluten out of our diet. And meat also is going to create an, an environment of unbalance of the bacteria um, opposed to plant-based, whole plant-based. Also, dairy is very linked with food sensitivities, so we don't do that, we don't do uh, milk and milk products. And then we have processed foods. That's a big one. That's going to destroy your, um, you know, your gut. So we don't want to use any processed foods at all. Do you think when you go to a restaurant you'll eat processed foods? Do they cook from scratch and then do they just going to plan a meal that is anti-inflammatory meal, or are they going to just plan a meal that's going to taste super good and it's going to give them a good income, right? That's what they want. They, you know, something that's going to taste super good, but uh, they don't want to spend much money on it, so it's not going to be um, organic, unless you go to an organic restaurant, plant-based organic, which is very hard to find. Um, but you're going to see all these foods have pesticides, right? It's not going to be organic. If it's not organic, it's going to be with pesticides. It's going to be with glyphosate. So you go to a restaurant, it's like glyphosate, unless it's organic. So that's why, you know, people like myself that has been sick, you know, some of you have been here in my testimony when I was sick. I don't eat in restaurants because I don't want to be sick again. I just super enjoy my life with full of energy. And you can ask my husband is here. I, I work 17 hours, I, I eat my seven hours, because I know that's very important, but I, I work nonstop, and I like the energy, and I like to think fast, and, and uh, I don't want to go back, backwards, so I do not, I will not eat inflammatory food. So no pesticides, no glyphosate, and no processed foods, and, um, because all these studies are showing they are linked to leaky gut, but I just want to go over, not over exactly, I just want to show you what are the more, um, the ultra-processed foods, okay? What are the ultra-processed foods? And this is where we have to really think when we're eating. Look at this, ultra-processed food, number one. What is number one? <laughs> bread, who does not eat bread? <laughs> I eat bread, but I, I eat uh, my own bread, my bread that I cook from scratch, and it's gluten-free bread, and it's very anti-inflammatory bread. So number two, what is it? Cakes, cookies, pies, and then the third, what is that? Can you give me an example of salty snacks? Pretzels, what else? Chips. Who doesn't eat chips? <laughs> Can you live without chips? <laughs> That'll be tough, huh? Well, we have, we have some, a recipe that we put in God Health Kitchen. We do chips out of um, yuca. So some of you ate yuca at lunch. That's pretty tasty. We needed to put a little salt. But um, you just cook yuca with salt, and then you press it down with a uh, presser, tortilla presser, and then you just put it that in your oven. And that gives you super good um, chips. So there is ways to still to eat chips in a healthy way. So, you know, and you can go on as sodas, of course, pizza. Everybody knows about that. And, and it's all, the, all these incredible, you know, tasty foods, but they're processed some. So those are the ultra, ultra processes that are, going, are linked to leaky gut. So we want to avoid. Um, also supplements. Leaky gut, some supplements, uh, uh, 
process, you know, drinks that they got, supplements for sports, so they say there's going to uh, um, harmful, harmful to the gut bacteria also, and they impair the intestinal berry function. So these supplements are not very well regulated, regulated. So what we do, people come to our lifestyle center with like this, tons of vitamins and minerals, thinking that, oh, this is going to repair, you know, my sickness, right? But we don't want to remove the cause of the problem. What good is it going to be? On top of that, these are processed vitamins and minerals. It's very hard to find good, healthy vitamins and minerals. Sometimes we, had, we tell our clients to do, if they need it, vitamin D. If it's sun, we tell them, go into the sun. And, uh, but let's say it's winter, right? So we tell them, okay, get um, vitamin D that is organic, plant-based, and it's um, three things, organic, plant-based and liquid. So, in liquid, because whatever they use to put the bananas together, you know, the filters and all that have chemicals, and they have stuff that they put on that we cannot tolerate. It's like a food, some foods we can, cannot tolerate, so we cannot tolerate these things, and the fillers on the bananas and minerals. So we have to be careful with that. So when people come to our lifestyle center, what well, we tell them, remove all your vitamins and minerals. Just stay with the, the prescription medications like um, blood pressure medication or blood sugar medications until you don't need it. And even there, we start decreasing these uh, medications. We have them call the doctor. Okay, I say, your blood pressure right now is, you know, 100 over 60. And I said, call your doctor to decrease your medication because you no longer need that high dosage. Uh, and when the blood sugar comes down, which is very, very common, even type 1 diabetes, uh, some people go from 40 units to 10 units. So it's time to decrease them, you know, the medication because the blood sugar is coming down so fast. And every day, sometimes our clients have to call the doctors and say, okay, my blood sugar is coming down because I'm, I'm eating very healthy. So the doctors have to adjust the medications. So we have to be very careful. Some people come to our lifestyle center and they say, okay, I didn't bring any of my, my medication. I said, no, that's a bad idea. And we are in the middle of nowhere and they came, you know, from, from the east and we, we are in the west. So, you know, we had to work harder to balance, uh, let's say the blood pressure, had to do a lot of natural remedies to, to speed it up the process of decreasing the blood pressure medication or the blood sugars, you know, they just quit the medication, so we like uh, had to work really hard to get them in the sun to decrease the blood sugar faster, or we get them also to eat certain foods that help with that process of exercise, uh, things like that. But, you know, sometimes that happens, but uh, um, we have to be careful with that. So this is a study about the mucus that Dr. Sweat was saying, um, and we had to protect um, this mucus barrier, and what um, helps, there's a study that show, let me see, maybe it's the next one, um, what helps us to raise the SCFA, when, I think it's the zinc, zinc. Okay, so when we're dealing with a, um, with a leaky gut, we need zinc, right? But we don't say, okay, take zinc and then and, and you'll be okay because you need zinc to fix your leaky gut. So we tell them, okay, eat the sources of zinc. You know, uh, there is zinc in the, in the food. So this is in our product because we, we eat a lot of uh, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, flax seeds, so, you know, lentils and cashews at times if people can tolerate. So we, we use the food because, you know, we're not eating balance or we have leaky gut so we cannot um, absorb this food. So as your leaky guts start fixing, you, you need these things. Another thing that helps uh, um, leaky gut is cur curcumin, so turmeric, right? So in our protocol, we have turmeric, two teaspoons of turmeric every morning of your life. You can give a, maybe a couple days off, you know, take a break, a couple days, but I, I in general don't, so I do 
unless I'm traveling, I forget. Like this time, I forgot my turmeric, but I usually travel with turmeric also. So we do two teaspoons of turmeric every morning. But this is the turmeric. You know, there was a study that said, which one's better? Curcumin is, the, you know, the, one of the ingredients of the turmeric that God has put on it that is super healthy. But they did a study that which one's better, curcumin or turmeric? Well, turmeric was, curcumin was great, but turmeric was better. So the way God, God made it is better. Um, so then we have glutathione. What does glutathione do? Um, the mucosal cells, that's what the one. So it protects the mucosal cells. That mucosal cell, Dr. So was talking about, so important. You don't have it, it's gonna eat you, right? So what does, you know, so it's very important to have good levels of glutathione, and we're gonna show what increases the glutathione in a little bit. And everything is through food. So here it is. Fruits, vegetables have more to high increase of glutathione. Frozen uh, foods generally had glutathione. These are the non-processed foods. Uh, similar to fresh fruits, increases the glutathione. So it's just being in the plant base. It's gonna increase it. Uh, glutathione, and the glutathione is going to uh, increase your mucosal uh, of the gut. So this is very important. Another thing is flavonoids modulate the glutathione. So this is another uh, great thing. So what, what are the uh, flavonoids? And I think it's coming in the next part. Flavonoids, orange, lemons, grapes, mulberry. So the way we use the orange is because when we are healing, we don't want to eat fruits that are very sweet, but very, just the fruits that are very low sugar. So we're hypo, you know, we want to keep the microbiome balanced at the beginning because our microbiome is so unbalanced that we, we don't want too much sweets, even sweet fruits. Uh, of course, sugar, chocolates, all that is gone, right? The cookies and all that's gone. But the oranges, the are sweet, so the way we eat it is the skin of the orange. So the skin of the orange is one of the most powerful anti-inflammatories that exists. It's similar to esteroids. So I found some studies about it, it's probably coming. Uh, so we wanna do uh, the orange peel, so one piece of the orange peel, we put it into our smoothie in the morning. Our smoothie is part of our, you know, uh, how we eat breakfast. So that is very important. Can you believe oranges is as powerful, the, the skin of the orange, as powerful as, as I said, as an esteroid. So I had this lady that had cross eyes, and a um, young girl, 21 year old, came to a lifestyle center. So we said, okay, you cannot miss your, people, when people have neurological conditions, we say you cannot miss your orange peel. You have to have your orange peel. You can buy it also in powder. So you can have, we give them, when they're in our lifestyle center, we give them two teaspoons every morning of orange organic powder. Don't forget, organic. We don't want any pesticides that are gonna destroy our bacteria. So um, this orange is well, it's gonna raise what? Glutathione, and glutathione is gonna make it healthy what? Mucosal, right? So isn't it amazing? Uh, because glutathione is one of the most powerful antioxidants that we have, so we do have that, we do want that. Um, so we move to the aloe vera. Aloe vera, you know, all these are studies. I like to show the data always because some people are not convinced. Some people, if I don't, they're gonna say we quacks. So I always find studies to back up with everything. So this is uh, aloe vera. So we use aloe vera, and this study is, um, it has helped uh, tendons improve age-related leaky gut. Can you believe? Uh, so aloe vera, so we do aloe vera four times a day. If people are really sick, they have to do four times a day. Otherwise, at bedtime. And we have the dosage in a little bit. Omega-3 is very important to help us uh, with leaky gut also. And uh, it's very necessary. Omega-3 is anti-inflammatory, right? Powerful anti-inflammatory that we all need and we need to take every day. You can give yourself two days of a break during the week, but you should have every day. I, in general, have my omega-3 my uh, omega three every morning with my breakfast. Every morning, every morning. If I don't, 
uh, I can get unbalance of my hormones because it's phytoestrogen also and it helps balance your hormones for females. Even for men, when they have prostate issues, that's gonna help them also decrease uh, issues with uh, prostate cancer. You know, I have a um, Dr. Phil, the urologist, um, friend of Dr. Sweat, one time we called him because this guy had a prostate cancer. So we consulted with him. I, I always give them, tell them, you know, when you have cancer of prostate, you have to have four tablespoons of ground um, flaxseed. So he said, yeah, you should have every day three tablespoons. All right, you know, close to four. So he said it's, it's, it is powerful. Okay, so omega-3 is very important, and this is going to decrease inflammation, especially linked to autoimmune disorders. Then we have another study here with um, omega-3. Uh, it's going to decrease inflammation. And Okay, so this is our protocol. So when we wake up, when we get up in the morning, first thing we do, we do, go to the bathroom, we weigh, check our weight. Because if you're very low in weight, we don't want you to lose more weight. Because, you know, when you're adjusting with your diet, you could lose a lot of weight. Which, if you are overweight, you want it, right? But if you're very low in weight, you don't want that. And with our immune uh, people, we're going to have the streams. We're going to have very overweight people and we very underweight people, super underweight people. So you want to check. So I always tell you, you check your weight every day. So that's going to help us to determine how you're doing, you know, with the protocol. So, um, so we do in the morning after people go to the bathroom, they check their weight and then we do lemon drink. So it's about three, three cups of, of water with one tablespoon of lemon juice. So I do four cups in the morning, every morning faithfully. I get up, warm up water, uh, one tablespoon of, of um, lemon juice. I always have, because I use so much lemon. Lemon is a powerful antioxidant. It can even decrease even the AGE forming of meat even. It's just amazing, lemon. So what I do, I press a lot of lemons and I have my little bottle, canning jar, the eight ounces, with Feel full of lemon juice. So I have it for, you know, for my salads, for my drink in the morning, and, you know, if I want to balance my bacteria, I'll tell you in a minute. So we do that. I do that every morning, drinking my water, four cups of water, warm water with one tablespoon lemon juice. So that's how I start my day. And then we have, this is uh, the turmeric, huh? It's the wrong title. This is a garlic uh, lemon drink. So we do this, we do two cloves of garlic with one t tablespoon of uh, lemon juice with four ounces of water. So I tell my patients to do four doses at a time or maybe for three days. Just double, triple, quadruple, blend it all, have it ready in a little jar container. So have it ready to serve yourself because you're gonna drink this uh, two meals a day. That's part of the protocol, and this really helps. Uh, the lemon is going to give the acidity. A lot, of, a lot of patients that have leaky gut and issues with autoimmune don't have enough acidity to digest proteins, so this seems to help a lot with uh, bloating too. And the garlic is powerful to, you know, keep in check the pathogenic bacteria. So we do that for, because this is, you know, it's the bacteria, right? The bacteria is very unbalanced, so you want to have a uh, good amounts of garlic is super powerful and anti-infective. And then we have here turmeric. The turmeric that we were saying is two teaspoons, and uh, we do at least five times a week. And we mix it, you know, the, usual, the way I do it is I mix it with a little bit of my smoothie. smoothie. I eat my smoothie. I want to enjoy my smoothie. I don't want to damage the taste of my smoothie. I actually like all my food tasting good. Uh, otherwise, I don't eat it, but that's why I'm spending time in the kitchen. So I eat my smoothie with my flaxseed, and we'll go how much of flaxseed we eat a day. So because flaxseed, so I put table two tablespoons in my smoothie, and I eat it like this with a spoon, 
because we don't want too much liquid, right? So, and I eat it until I have this amount of smoothie, and then I mix it with two teaspoons of turmeric. And then I eat that because uh, I want to enjoy my smoothie, right? Because it's going to change the flavor. But some people cannot just, cannot tolerate it that way. So what we do is we do um, milk, coconut milk, and we do everything from scratch, remember? Nothing we buy it pre-made, nothing, zero. Because, you know, like, you know, Sister Cher this morning, if you want to give a chance, a lady that almost died four times and has been sick for so many years and is, you know, unable to cook because she's so weak, that's the only way to survive. That's the only way you are going to regain your health. So that's what we said. You know, I, I'm not, I don't believe that a person should go gradually. You know, it's never going to get there. It's going to be gradually. I think the Seventh-day Adventist Church started with the, with the veggie meats because this was a transition to go into whole plant days. It got stuck there for how many years? I mean, 50 years? No, 100 years since Kellogg. So, um, so what I noticed when our, our, our patients that I help at our lifestyle center, it's called Turkey. They're coming, they're doing detox, we help them with the symptoms, with hydrotherapies, whatever they have. They have headaches because they stop cold turkey coffee. So we do therapies that in 15 minutes stop the headache. And then the next day, another therapy with hydrotherapy is gone, and it's gone. The headache is gone. So then they feel a little sick because they're not eating this junk, right? But then they start feeling amazing. You know, for like four days, five days, it's like, a, oh, I never feel this good in so many years. So that's the effect that we want to see. And when you see something like that, people, people are so incredibly blessed and happy to have this incredible health. So that's why, to me, you change it, and you're going to be blessed, and it's going to be amazing. And we start with a little detox, and we do a detox of about, uh, before we used to do five days of detox, no food, only liquids, and it was a little tough, you know, five days not eating. And, you know, I always detox with people, so I'm like, I'm suffering, and, you know, I'm getting hungry day three, and day four, day five, you know, and I, and I always say um, to Dr. Joyce, I say, you know, I really need to change this. No, 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 don't change it. This is, this is amazing. This is better than any other detox, and just keep it like that. It's not hard, but, but she's hard, you know. <laughs> she can do it. There's people that cannot do it. So we decided to change our detox to be a little easier, and we changed this in September last year. So our last detox, we did it two days, two days and a half. It's almost three days because the first meal that when they come is Sunday, and they don't eat until, you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, lunch. So, but it's not like I had to wait till Friday. So we did these changes, and guess what? People got well. You know, and we had these people that, they, they were sick for so many years, but they left normal, and I never experienced that. And I said, oh, if I wouldn't know that we can just go through this in an easier way and not suffer. And so since then, we changed our, our detox. It's still very clean. It's still, very, um, still doing juices, things like that. And, um, but we start doing also for five days, we do totally raw foods, because we want to uh, fix the bacteria, right? With raw foods, you want to balance the bacteria, and raw foods do that. Um, so it's been incredible. Okay, let's go back to the turmeric. So when people cannot tolerate with a smoothie, what we have them to do is just mix it with a little coconut milk, which we do it, and you can find the recipes, the two easiest recipes of how to make coconut milk in the Gut Health Kitchen channel. So chicken in there. And so we mix it with a little honey. And my husband said that it is like a dessert. Can you believe something so bitter can taste like dessert? You know, they call the golden milk. So, so that's how you can take it if you, it can, if you cannot tolerate. And then we had the orange peel that we said at least five times a week, two teaspoons every day. This has been a super, super blessing. We, had to, we started implementing this um, maybe just in the last four years, and that 
uh, and then I noticed with patients, like I said, neurological conditions improving really uh, fast. Then we have the flax seed. Flax seed, here's the, the recipe. Men, one tablespoon every day, unless they're getting older, maybe in the 40s, 50s, then they had to take two tablespoons of flax seed every day. And if they have uh, prostate issues, they will have to go to four to balance, you know, it's too much of the male hormone. So we, you wanna balance with, with uh, phytoestrogen. And then for woman, is uh, if they're premenopause, they're gonna feed two tablespoons a day for postmenopause. So like myself, it's gonna have to be four tablespoons. If you don't do this, you might have hot flashes and things like that. And I remember when we had um, um, fires, right, in California, we left three weeks. Somehow they wouldn't allow us to go back, but somehow at night I will walk like 45 minutes from the, you know, we live in the mountains and go and get some foods and machines because I'm used to using all kind of things, you know, cooking from scratch, you have to have everything you need. And, um, but one thing I neglected was the flaxseed. Guess what? After two weeks, I start having hot flashes. I like, you know, it takes about two weeks to start kicking in and start helping to balance your bacteria. So it takes two weeks. So don't believe that. Once you change the, you know, it's like a, a peel. It's not a peel. You know, your body had to adjust, your body had to build up, had to balance, things like that. So for women, it's four tablespoons, and it has helped so many people with hot flashes and balance their hormones. Then we have here green juices. Do you know that there is a, a right way to do green juices and the wrong way to do green juices? You can do a super bad way to do green juices and unbalance your, your thyroid. Your thyroid, and if you do a lot of cruciferous. You know, there's people that does cruciferous and blend the cruciferous with fruit. You're not supposed to f mix fruits, fruits and vegetables. You know, we've been canceled. Because it's gonna cause fermentation. So, and it's gonna uh, cause unbalance your thyroid and people, especially people that are having, you know, uh, their Hashimoto, um, we, we have them to do minimal. So we balance smaller amounts because cruciferous are very powerful. You don't need it so much, but you do need it because they're powerful. So we do, you know, and a juice, you don't want it to be all sweet. So if you do a juice that is like a carrot juice, 100%, that's gonna unbalance your bacteria, it's too sweet, too sweet. It's gonna create a lot of issues to your pancreas also, and you're sick, so you cannot afford doing that. So uh, what we did at the beginning was, because the good thing to have a lifestyle center is, that is clinical trials. You're constantly in doing clinical trials. What's working, what's not working? You try with, okay, oh wow, that's working. Okay, let's try with everybody. Oh, this is amazing, and that's how we improve our programs. Every program is a little, upgraded a little bit as we learn that things work better than others. So at the beginning, you know, we have people that have a lot of uh, candida. You know, some people have so much candida, they're scratching, scratching in the patches. You know, when you have candida, that means you, your, your bacteria, your microbiome is so unbalanced. It's coming out of your body, all the pathogenic bacteria. So uh, we realized when we're doing that, um, that we need to decrease the carrots. So we, need, we, we used to do two thirds was carrot juice and the rest was greens. So we decreased to 50-50. It was better, but the people that came with candida had this tone that was really white, it will come back. So I said, oh, that's a little too much still. So we said, okay, let's decrease the carrot to one third and let's do two thirds of, of greens. And that was just perfect. So it was so balanced and people didn't have any more issues with that, people start feeling better, the inflammation start disappearing, uh, because we know because the pain start going away. You know, people with arthritis, in five days you can have just no pain at all. So, and then we introduce certain foods and the pain comes back, so, you know, that's how we determine. And then we realize, okay, what are the, the, the greens that are mild and people can tolerate well? So then we, uh, you know, realize cucumber is good, cucumber, celery, lettuce, so let's do one, one half a cup of cucumbers, half a cup of celery, half a cup of lettuce, and then half a cup of cruciferous with one cup of carrots. So you have how many cups? Two cups of greens, one cup of, of carrots. So then you mix it. After you ma make it, you mix it, and after you mix it, you divide it in three, right? Because that's three cups. And then you drink it 30 minutes before each meal, and then 
you have your perfect juice. And uh, with, with that's going to help balance your bacteria, balance the supplements that you need, the vitamins that you need, that's, that's that. So, plus the, the way we eat. But for us, juicing is a supplement. It's not a meal. You're not replacing a meal. Because a lot of people say, oh, yeah, you're wasting so much, um, you know, fiber. Thing. No, no, no. All our meals are 100% fiber. This is our supplement, the best, because, you know, a lot of people cannot process so much uh, fiber either, so, you know, this is what is going to go to the bloodstream. And then we have the aloe vera. The aloe vera that we do, we do one inch by one inch, and what we do is we put the aloe vera, the big leaf, put it in water, and it's going to leach all the bitterness, and the next day it's not going to be bitter, but every day you have to change the water. And you can keep that big aloe for one month, and it's fine. And then you eat from the bottom a piece, and you're going to eat one inch by one inch, about. And then, um, yeah, you drink it 15 minutes before meals. I think I need water. You didn't drink it. <coughs> <coughs> you didn't drink it. Okay, so um, sometimes when I start coughing, because I swallow wrong, <coughs> you can stop coughing sometimes. But okay, so it's one inch of aloe 15 minutes before meals and at bedtime. I have a girl that has been sick for since she was a little child. She's <clears throat> now 16, and she cannot tolerate, you know, you'll be amazed. There are some people. <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes I cannot tolerate some stuff is in our protocol. Cannot tolerate onions, cannot tolerate garlic, cannot tolerate lemon, and that's the case of this girl. She's, they put a tube to feed her because she's lost so much weight, <coughs> and then she had pro child protective services because they think the parents are not good parents, but that's not the case. You know, they, they have serious leaky gut. <clears throat> and uh, so, so we have to, the only thing she can tolerate is the aloe. The aloe was, and she will have two hours of abdominal pain after she eats. Two hours when I started helping her. So the pain has big time decreased. And uh, so the aloe helped. So there's always ways to help when somebody cannot tolerate this or that because even as great as our foods are in the protocol, sometimes you have to make some adjustments. And then we have charcoal powder. <clears throat> so charcoal powder, one teaspoon to one tablespoon um, mixed with eight ounces of water 10 minutes before um, the, before the aloe, yeah, in the, in the night, right? Because you had to drink take aloe 15 minutes before meal and at bedtime. And that, aloe is the last thing, because you want to coat it, the digestive lining, you want to coat it with aloe vera. So that's the last thing you do. So the, the charcoal is 30 minutes before the aloe, and the charcoal is to detoxify you. Because we are constantly, you know, um, we, we are bombarded with toxins, you know, in the environment, we are water with, you know, there's nothing perfect anymore, so you have to detoxify you. And uh, charcoal is um, an amazing thing to do. So we say one teaspoon to do one teaspoon because one teaspoon for people that have, you know, constipation, things like that. So you cannot go so much until the constipation is all fixed. And people that have diarrhea, things like that, one teaspoon is good. And if you have good bowels, one teaspoon is good too. So that's our protocol in summary. Um, oh, I forgot about this one. Uh, ginger. Ginger tea is great also for digestion. And we do this a tea. We cut one inch of ginger, slice it, put water, three cups of water, 
um, boil it because when you boil it, it's better, much better. Uh, some people put in the smoothies, but boiling is better. The data showed that it's much better. And then you do it three, three times a week only. Too much of that is too stimulatory, so we don't do it every day. Um, oh, I forgot that one. This is the most important thing. This is a super amazing, amazing, amazing anti-inflammatory drink. Some people that are super sick, and this has helped. Uh, a lot of this has helped uh, people with um, COVID, very sick, long COVID. All this has been, we have long COVID people that come to a large cell center, that these protocols have greatly helped. But the Onion Brother is amazing because people are having a lot of joint pain, muscle pain, so the more pain, the more of this broth that we give them. So it is four cups, four, uh, three cups of water with one large onion, those from Costco, big one, uh, five cloves of garlic, we mash it like five minutes before, and then uh, we boil for 15 minutes, and um, you drink it. Sometimes when I start feeling sick, that I'm getting cold, things like that, I, I drink four cups, sometimes I drink eight cups, so some people are super sick. We have an assistant, um, tech assistant for men missionary. He was very sick, he almost died. So I wasn't here. You're drinking eight cups of onion broth. I say, oh no, well, you know, uh, you know, I don't have, I run out of onion. Oh, you, this is a mass. And you know, all these things are a mass when you are sick, if you wanna recover. These are super incredible, uh, super healing foods that God has given us to recover. So this is an addition of what the menu, right? What we eat, we eat in the morning. You know, we don't mix fruits and vegetables. We separate our meals for five hours. We don't eat at night. Um, the combination is super important. Uh, not missing any servings is, is very important uh, of, of the foods. You know, the requirements for the day um, are very important. But what I'm showing today is just the protocol. So, you know, these are incredibly healing. Um, you know, like, like Sister Cher story, we have many stories just like her. It's not an isolated case. We have people that have been sick just like her, super sick. All, all, almost all their lives I was helping this lady was sick since her 20s. She couldn't even work. She graduated from uh, being a teacher and then she couldn't could never be a teacher because she became disabled. Until now that she's 57 now, and now she's back normal. She's back to normal, imagine, 57. And uh, so, but, but you know, we do these things that God created for us to be healthy and to bring restoration. So that's my talk. So I want to encourage you, if you're very sick, you know, join the med missionary training because then we will have everything in the whole package about how to eat breakfast, how to eat lunch, how to apply all this, and we go over all this. Uh, and when we have videos, how to prepare your foods, how to sprout, because we sprout everything, because when you sprout, there is a lot of data that shows. When you sprout, it's for better digestion. People that don't sprout, you know, people having a lot of pain and bloating, when they sprout, then the bloating is gone, the pain is gone. And also, it's much better um, nutrition. It raises the nutrition incredibly. Um, so, you know, when, so when you cannot digest foods, when you cannot um, absorb your foods well, so this, all these principles are going to help you. So that's, that's the end, and I want to uh, pray for you, and, uh, and I hope that you know, this weekend has been helpful to apply things, start changing things, and applying things at home, and that uh, we can all be a part of the army of people, the medical missionaries that this world need. And uh, I'm going to finish with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you so much because you have given us the answers for, for these times that we live in, which there is so much pollution. There is these staple foods that the devil has destroyed, and we cannot e even eat it anymore. But you have given us the answers, and you have given us so much variety of other foods that we can eat, and still eating balance, and even be stronger than ever, and stand at end times healthy, and to help other people. 
and to bring these people to your feet. This is our goal. The, the goal is bring salvation to people. So I just want to ask that everybody that has been coming to this weekend, that you give them more knowledge, you give them more of all they, they will need to recover and to join your army of people to bring salvation to this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, how many want to thank uh, Dr. Ballard and Do Dr. Sweet Slit for being here today? That's awesome, huh? Awesome information. I, I learned one thing. I I'm kind of like one extreme to the other. Like uh, I just learned today that when I do make my smoothies, I can't put too much, uh, what do you call those again? That kind of green vegetables, too much. Juicing too much uh, kale or juicing too much spinach. I go from one extreme to the other. I say, honey, I think I need spinach. Vroom, I just fill the whole thing up with spinach with a, a big smoothie. And then the other day, uh, we got carrots <laughs> from the, uh, we got a bunch of carrots. And boy, I was drinking, hey, I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to drink pure carrot juice. <laughs> I had like five cups of carrot juice. It was so good. One extreme to the other. So. I need to be balanced out. So I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord be with you. And uh, I'm going to make a commitment so you guys can hold me accountable for that, to be able to take up this health message and apply it to my life. And I hope that, that you can make the same decision too. If you want to become a health uh, coach as well, uh, just visit, like Sister Mercy said, uh, medmissionary.com, and they have great information there, just super information on how we can transform our lives so we can glorify God in our bodies. Thank you again. Uh, let us stand, let us pray, and, and we'll end this program tonight. Father God, thank you again for allowing us to understand and just grasp a little bit better what it means to live a healthy lifestyle. Father, we pray that we can implement that in our lives so we can glorify you, so we can be a light that shines to the community as well. Uh, be with us this week and just take care of us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tomorrow morning, we do have a breakfast, not breakfast, it's 1130, food demonstration We'll call them breakfast burritos, but you'll just come show up and you'll, you'll taste some stuff.